Hello there, my fellow fans of the Warhammer Fantasy Universe, and welcome to the start of another series within this setting. Last time, I asked you guys what you would like me to cover next, and after counting all the votes, as few as they were, you guys decided this topic is gonna be Bretonia. Now, Bretonia isn't another race, like the Dwarves or the Elves, but it is a lore-rich and very unique faction, comparable in complexity with the Empire itself. In today's video, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what these folks are all about, as well as talk about its ancient history and how the country became unified. One note I would like to make before beginning, and this will concern all my Britonia videos, is the fact that its lore is at least partially inspired by the French Dark Ages. Thus, most of the names are French sounding. My French is rather poor, so I would like to humbly apologize in advance for butchering any of these names. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about Bretonia, shall we? The Kingdom of Bretonia is a highly chivalrous feudal kingdom that lies between the lands of the Grey Mountains and the Great Ocean. Bretonia is second in size only to the Empire of Man, which is both their chief rival and closest ally. They are known for having a culture and society revolving around the ideas of nobility, social birthright, and the upholding of a very strict code of chivalry. Ruled by a Royarch, which is a fancy name for king, the nation of Bretonia has been known throughout the kingdoms of men for having the greatest knights within the entire Old World, even surpassing that of the numerous knightly orders of the Empire. A proud and honorable kingdom, the warriors of Bretonia are comprised mostly of knights and noblemen, who ride into battle with lance, horse and sword, seeking out glories and rooting out injustice wherever they go. The Knights of Bretonia are trained to fight from childhood, their skills further enhanced through constant training, battle and tourney. Due to this regime, the combined military might of Bretonia has surpassed that of even the greatest armies of history. The religion that currently dominates this mighty feudal kingdom is the worship of a deity known as the Lady of the Lake. The Bretonian calendar is offset from the Sigmarian Empire's calendar by about 977 years, as the people of the Bretoni weren't fully united until the reign of King Gilles. However, though these honorable warriors are meant to uphold chivalry and justice above all other traits, they are nonetheless afflicted by a much darker side from the shining knights they believe themselves to be. Within the feudal social structure of Bretonia, these knights consider their lowly subjects as subhuman, as if they are nothing more than property in their hubris-filled and arrogant eyes. Indeed, the life of a Bretonian peasant is a life fraught with endless injustice and cruelty, by a nobility whose sole duty was meant to protect them and to uphold their duties as beacons of justice. Though such cruelty and injustice are commonplace in these lands, there is no doubt within the minds of the Old World that the Knights of Bretonia are still among the greatest human warriors within the realms of men. The land of Bretonia didn't really exist during the time of Sigmar and the early days of the Empire. Indeed, many centuries passed before a great and noble knight united the highly independent and prideful Bretoni tribes in the same way Sigmar had with the birth of the Empire. The early days of Bretonian history are not well recorded, though it has been conjectured that, as within the wider world, it may have once been ruled by the cold-blooded lizardmen at the dawn of the planet's creation. Long after their first great struggle to hold back the forces of chaos, during the first great chaos incursion, the land that would later become known as Bretonia was settled by the High Elves of Ulfuan, this being done during the reign of the Phoenix King Belshanar. These colonies survived the civil war with Malekith, and the cataclysm known as the Sundering relatively unscathed, 
but they were soon faced with the full might of the dwarves in the time known as the War of the Beard. Bretonia was the primary battleground of that war, which lasted for around four centuries. The conflict finally ended with the death of Phoenix King Calidor II, and the subsequent capture of the Phoenix Crown by the dwarves. However, the war had so weakened the High Elves of the time, that the next Phoenix King, Caradriel, ordered a withdrawal of all the Elves back to Wulfuan. The few Elves who refused this command retreated into the enchanted glades of Athel Loran, and over the centuries transformed into what is now known as the Wood Elves. It was around this time that the first nomadic human settlers of Bretonia appeared. Circa 1500 years before the time of Sigmar, an agricultural tribe of people arrived on the western edge of Axbite Pass. These primitives had little knowledge of metalwork or warfare, and relied heavily on agriculture and flint weapons to survive in this harsh wilderness. These groups of humans were known to have worshipped a primordial earth elemental goddess called Raya, and erected many primitive stone circles in her honor. These stone circles were places of great natural power, and were marked with symbols that remained as a foundation of the Druidic Old Faith to this day. Around 500 years later, a second wave of human migrations crossed over the World's Edge Mountains in their tens of thousands, escaping the rampages of the Greenskin Threat. These new tribes were warlike, strong and fierce, and they fought both Greenskin and indigenous population alike. While most of these tribes eventually settled within the lands that would eventually become the Empire, one far-ranging tribe crossed the Grey Mountains. This tribe, called the Bretoni, was to give its very name to the land they found. Like their kin within the lands of the Empire, they displaced both the Greenskins and the human Earth worshippers, thus soon becoming the dominant culture west of the Grey Mountains. Bretonian recorded history can vary greatly from duchy to duchy, being recorded and maintained as it is, mostly by the monks within the many Grail monasteries spread across the land. When Sigmar founded the Empire, he extended an invitation to all the Bretoni warlords to join him in this great new confederation. Despite noble Sigmar's goal of pan-human unity, the cultural differences between the Bretoni and his people were apparently too large to overcome. The Bretoni would also remain as a whole a fractured people. In time, trade and knowledge of masonry and metalworks was eventually gained by the nearby proximity of the dwarves living within the Grey Mountains, which allowed the early sub-tribes of the Bretoni to resemble something closer towards their modern state. Among the tribe of the Bretoni, it became the custom for the best and bravest young man of the village to be armed and ready at all times to fight off any foes. Everyone else in the village toiled to provide for themselves, but also to feed and equip this warrior and his warhorse. This warrior lived off the fat of the land, ate the best meat, and drank the best wine. This, together with constant training and practice at arms, set him apart from ordinary men. He was physically bigger, stronger, fitter, and more robust, standing head and shoulders above the ordinary peasants. This chosen warrior took up residence in the village watchtower, a wooden structure which would in later times evolve into a stone castle. He would also take as a wife the fairest maiden in all the village. In return for all this, the warrior was honor-bound to defend the village against any foe, no matter how terrible. These warriors became known as knights, and as the centuries passed, both knight and warhorse became exceptional examples of their kind. Although knights were known among other human tribes of the Old World as well, it was among the Bretoni tribes that the tradition of knighthood was perfected. Among the Bretoni, each petty king or warlord soon began to rename themselves as a duke of a small dukedom. By the year 770 IC, 
the lands of all Bretonia had since been divided into sixteen realms, each ruled by its own duke. The Greenskins had lived within the lands alongside the Bretoni for many years, and as is normal for these foul creatures, their population eventually reached a critical mass, and began to overrun the Bretoni lands in a seething green tide. By the year 930 IC, a massive horde of orcs, led by the warlord Gragabad, poured out of the mountains and overran the lands of Quillo. Faced with imminent destruction, the last of the remaining knights of Quillo rode out in a last desperate battle, and fought the Greenskins on the open plains. Though the orcs fell like wheat before the scythe, the last of the knights of Quillo perished to the last man. In the wake of this disaster, the armies of Quenel and Brion rode forth and attacked the now weakened orc army. No sooner had the orcs began to rout from the battlefield, that the two Bretonian armies faced each other over the rulership of the devastated land of Quillo. Fortunately, the two armies didn't have the stomach to face each other in combat, and instead, the two dukes of each kingdom fought one another in an honorable duel. By the end, the Lord of Brion was struck down, and Quenel was expanded. It is said that the destruction of Quillo marked the beginning of the wars which would culminate in the unification of the whole kingdom. By the year 932 IC, Balduin, the newly stated young Duke of Brion, led his armies to victory, after defeating the remaining hordes of Gragabad and slaying the warlord in single combat. In the battle, Gragabad's great axe became lodged fast in Balduin's shield, and the Lord fought the entire battle with the axe in place. Afterwards, the axe was adopted as the symbol of Brion, in memory of this event. This victory didn't stop the orcs, however, and around 948 IC, the northern lands of Bretonia were engulfed by waves of enemy armies. Northern raiders from the frigid shores of Norska burned the coastlines of Lyonnais and Coron, while beastmen warherds poured forth in ridiculous numbers from the dark woodlands of Ardennes. Beset by three enemy invasions, the Bretoni of the northern lands were forced to relinquish all they once ruled, hiding behind their stout walls while the enemy roamed across their lands at will. To the south and east, restless goblin tribes came down from their homes within the Grey Mountains, pillaging and burning their way through the dukedoms of Quenel and Bastogne. By 974 I see, orc tribes once again poured from the mountains and forests in numbers never before seen. Cut off from any aid, the once ancient dukedom of Glaboriel was utterly destroyed. In response, the Bretoni knights rose up against the onslaught of the Greenskins, charging headlong towards the many battlefields that were springing up all across the realm. However, the lords of each dukedom didn't take the time to properly gather their knights into a single unified force. Outnumbered and surrounded, these scattered bands of knights were soon overwhelmed by the superior numbers of the orcs. With the enemies of man amassing all around them, the remaining dukes had all but lost their hopes. But, as is typical in these tales, there was one duke, in this dark time, who didn't give way to despair, and was determined to unite all the people into a single strong nation. This ancient and legendary uniter was Duke Gilles Le Breton the newly crowned Duke of Bastogne, the famous knight who personally killed the red worm Smiargus, deep within the forest of Chalon. Gilles rallied first Duke Fierulf de Lyonnais, and then his greatest and most loyal friend, Duke Landuin de Musilon, under his crusading banner. But even these free men and their combined army found themselves outmatched and facing certain annihilation. This inexperienced and badly battered Bretoni army then encamped themselves beside the lake. Upon the morrow, they felt certain to face doom upon the field of battle, with the war drums of the Orc Wa allowing them neither rest nor sleep. That morning, when all hope seemed lost for the Bretoni cause, a true miracle unfolded upon Gilles and his army of knights. 
As he knelt before the lakeside to drink of its pure waters and pray for strength, an ethereal and heavenly beautiful woman arose out of the mist, leaving the Bretoni army aghast and afraid. Gilles was the first to make a move, raising the blood-stained and tattered banner of Bastogne High, inspired by some genius and desperate madness, and he cried out, Lady, wouldst thou bless mine banner? He then dipped it into the lake at the lady's feet. When he drew it forth and raised it high so that all could see, it was dry and fully restored, only now emblazoned with the glowing icon of a golden grail. The other dukes and knights then scrambled to follow his example, asking the lady to bless their swords, lances, and war horses for the coming battle. Finally, the lady held forth a large gilded chalice overflowing with light, giving it first to Gilles and then to his companions to drink from and gain the strength needed to achieve victory. These three men became the very first Grail Knights, and fighting under the banner of the Lady of the Lake, the Bretoni gained the courage to face the Greenskins upon the plains. Then the dirge of the approaching army was heard from all sides, fouling the air with their war cries and drumming. The knights hurriedly took their weapons and mounted their horses. They gathered in a battle line around Gilles and the magic banner. The orc horde darkened the horizon ahead of the Bretonian knights. Steadily and without flinching, they rode on as the arrows dropped around them. Then the moment came to charge, and the knights plunged into the midst of the orc horde. The first ranks of the enemy crumbled before them, and the entire horde reeled like some great beast pierced by the hunter's lance. All around them the enemy began to scatter in flight, and as the sun began to set, the knights ceased their pursuit and rode back to the sacred lake. Here they gathered once again and rested, as the rooks and ravens descended to feast on the orcish army. All the dukes and knights gathered around Gilles, and together they vowed to serve and honor the Lady of the Lake. They also vowed to stay together as an army and free Bretonia from the orcs and all their enemies. Gilles was proclaimed leader of battles, with the authority to command the army and the entire resources of all the dukedoms until Bretonia was free. This moment was the origin of the Grail Knights, but also the Kingdom of Bretonia. In the years which followed, under the banner of the Lady of the Lake, Gilles led his Grail Knights from victory to victory throughout the length and breadth of Bretonia. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Bretonia and its history for today. In the next episode, like I've been doing so far, I'll probably continue talking about its history before starting another race or faction. Was this video entertaining or informative? In that case, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing for future content. And if you'd like to help me keep making these videos, especially since my fantasy videos get the fewest views, please go check my Patreon page, the link for which is in the video description. I thank you kindly for watching to the end, and I wish you all a peaceful day. The ladies' blessings be upon you.